Samia Hangwarai, your English instructor, and today we're going to deal with Unit 16, Critical Thinking, titled, What is the Soul? So, let's begin. Unit 16, Critical Thinking. What is the soul? Now, read the following essay about the existence of the soul in the materialist world. One of the most painful circumstances of recent advances in science is that each one makes us know less than what we thought we did. When I was young, we all knew, or thought we knew, that a man consists of a soul and a body. That the body is in time and space, but the soul is in time only. Whether the soul survives death was a matter as to which opinions might differ, but that there is a soul which was thought to be indubitable. As for the body, the plain man of course considered its existence self-evident and so did the man of science, but the philosopher was apt to analyze it away after one fashion or another, reducing it usually to ideas in the mind of the man who had the body and anybody else who happened to notice him. The philosopher, however, was not taken seriously, and science remained comfortably materialistic even in the hands of quite orthodox scientists. Nowadays, these fine old simplicities are lost. Physicists assure us that there is no such thing as matter, and psychologists assure us that there is no such thing as mind. This is an unprecedented occurrence. Who ever heard of a cobbler saying that there was no such thing as boots, or a tailor maintaining that all men are really naked? Yet, that would have been no odder than what physicists and certain psychologists have been doing. To begin with the latter, some of them attempt to reduce everything that seems to be mental activity to an activity of the body. There are, however, various difficulties in the way of reducing mental activity to physical activity. I do not think we can yet say with any assurance whether these difficulties are or are not insuperable. What we can say on the basis of physics itself is that what we have hitherto called our body is really an elaborate scientific construction not corresponding to any physical reality. The modern would-be materialist thus finds himself in a curious position, for while he may with a certain degree of success reduce the activities of the mind to those of the body, he cannot explain away the fact that the body itself is merely a convenient concept invented by the mind. We find ourselves thus going round and round in a circle, mind in his emanation of the body, and body is an invention of the mind. Evidently, this cannot be quite right, and we have to look for something that is neither mind nor body, out which both can spring. Let us begin with the body. The plain man thinks that material objects must certainly exist, since they are evident to the senses. Whatever else may be doubted, it is certain that anything you can bump into must be real. This is the plain man's metaphysic. This is all very well, but the physicist comes along and shows you that you never bump into anything. Even when you run your hand along a stone wall, you do not really touch it. When you think you touch a thing, there are certain electrons and protons forming part of your body, which are attracted and repelled by certain electrons and protons in the thing you think you are touching, but there is no actual contact. The electrons and protons in your body, becoming agitated by nearness to the other electrons and protons, are disturbed and transmit a disturbance along your nerves to the brain. The effect in the brain is what is necessary to your sensation of contact, and by suitable experiments, this sensation can be made quite deceptive. The electrons and protons themselves, however, are only crude first approximation, a way of collecting into a bundle either trains of waves or the statistical probabilities of various different kinds of events. Thus, matter has become altogether too ghostly to be used as an adequate stick with which to beat the mind. Matter in motion, which used to seem so unquestionable, turns out to be a concept quite inadequate for the need of physics. 
Nevertheless, modern science gives no indication whatever of the existence of the soul or mind as an entity. Indeed, the reasons for disbelieving in it are very much of the same kind as the reasons for disbelieving in matter. Mind and matter were something like the lion and the unicorn fighting for the crown. The end of the battle is not the victory of one or the other, but the discovery that both are only heraldic inventions. The world consists of events, not of things, that endure for a long time and have changing properties. Events can be collected into groups by their casual relations. If the casual relations are of one sort, the resulting group of events may be called a physical object, and if the casual relations are of another sort, the resulting group may be called a mind. Any event that occurs inside a man's head will belong to groups of both kinds. Considered as belonging to a group of one kind, it is a constituent of his brain. And considered as belonging to a group of the other kind, it is a constituent of his mind. Thus, both mind and matter are merely convenient ways of organizing events. There can be no reason for supposing that either a piece of mind or a piece of matter is immortal. The sun is supposed to be losing matter at the rate of millions of tons a minute. The most essential characteristic of mind is memory, and there is no reason whatever to suppose that the memory associated with a given person survives that person's death. Indeed, there is every reason to think the opposite, for memory is clearly connected with a certain kind of brain structure, and since this structure decays at death, there is every reason to suppose that memory also must cease. Although metaphysical materialism cannot be considered true, yet emotionally the world is pretty much the same as I would be if the materialists were in the right. I think the opponents of materialism have always been acutated by two main desires. The first, to prove that the mind is immortal, and the second to prove that the ultimate power in the universe is mental rather than physical. In both these respects, I think the materialists were in the right. Our desires, it is true, have considerable power on the earth's surface. The greater part of the land on this planet has quite different aspect from that which it would have if men had not utilized it to extract food and wealth. But our power is very strictly limited. We cannot at present do anything whatever to the sun or moon or even to the interior of the earth and there is not the faintest reason to suppose that what happens in regions to which our power does not extend has any mental causes. That is to say, to put the matter in a nutshell, there is no reason to think that except on the earth's surface anything happens because somebody wishes it to happen. And since our power on earth's surface is entirely dependent upon the sun, we could hardly realize any of our wishes if the sun grew cold. It is of course rash to dogmatize as to what science may achieve in the future. We may learn to prolong human existence longer than now seems possible. But, if there is any truth in modern physics, more particularly in the second law of thermodynamics, we cannot hope that the human race will continue forever. Some people may find this conclusion gloomy, but if we are honest with ourselves, we shall have to admit that what is going to happen many millions of years, hence, has no very great emotional interest for us here and now. And science, while it diminishes our cosmic pretensions, enormously increases our terrestrial comfort. That is why, in spite of the horror of the theologians, science has on the whole been tolerated. What is the soul? Materialists cannot fathom that the existence of a soul is real because they mainly believe that if there is a physical structure to it, if we can touch it, if we can see, feel, or if it tingles any of our five sensations, then only it can exist. But unlike a body, we cannot see, hear, feel our soul. That is why materialists deny that souls exist. So, the author believes that people are made up of events. We are all an accumulation of events that have been happening throughout our lives and we are not only composed of a body or a soul. 
Although people believe that human souls are real and they do exist, but due to the lack of his physical body, it is quite difficult to comprehend it or understand it. And also, majority of the people have been taught that body exists in both time and space. However, the soul, it only exists in space. The soul is also a convenient method of arranging our events. And the author argues that once a human being passes away, their memory also fades along with them. Hence, the soul also does not survive the death. And towards the end of the chapter, the writer does agree that yes, human beings have certain powers on earth. They have certain desires. That is why we are able to make the change that we have seen around the world. However, regardless, our powers on earth are still limited. We can always wish for many things to happen, but the impossible will never come true. I can think and think and think and think and wish and wish and wish and wish for gravity to go away. However, like we mentioned, the power of a human being on earth is limited. Hence, regardless of wishing for many times for, the, for gravity to disappear, that is not going to happen. Anyways, the author has concluded the chapter by saying that science is mainly tolerated because it has been accommodating and advancing humanity further and making their lives easier. Hence, this is also the main reason why people like to think, like to tolerate science. Homework. Number one, do you think that the soul exists? Explain in reference to the chapter. So you have to mention in your personal opinion whether you think that soul exists or not. But you have to make sure that whatever arguments you give, you give by reading the chapter. Number two, can the body or the soul exist independently? Here, you have to write your personal opinions whether you think that the soul or the body can survive on its own. Or do you believe that no, the soul and the body, they both require one another in order to survive. Number three, humans have certain powers on earth, but they are limited. Elaborate. So you need to make it clear how human beings have powers on earth, but in what sense are they limited? If you have any queries, please feel free to email us at learning at dearwalk.edu.np. Thank you very much.